Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. This episode is sponsored by Ace Dots Academy's online course, How to Start Building Your Wealth, Investing in the Stock Market. I wrote this course for those who want to go from feeling frustrated, intimidated, or overwhelmed by the stock market to becoming confident and in control of their financial future. Go to myworstinvestmentever.com slash deals to claim your discount now. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts, and I'm here with featured guest, Carr Shergren. Carr, are you ready to rock? I am indeed, Andrew. From originally from the Motor City. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I want to tell the audience a bit about you and... Uh, so the first thing is that uh, in 2019, Carr wrote the book, The Fair Share Model, a performance-based capital structure for venture stage initial public offerings. And in it, it presents an idea for how to raise venture capital via an IPO. The concept can be applied to a blockchain venture that raises equity capital via initial coin offering also. Its name describes its purpose to balance and align the interests of investors and employees. A Detroit native, Carl has a BA and MBA from Michigan State University and is a certified public accountant and credentialed in turnaround management. Carl, take a moment and fill in some further tidbits about your life. Well, hi, Andrew, uh, and hi, everybody. You know, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I came to write the book, The Fair Share Model. And, and it, uh, from 1996 to 2001, I was co-founder and CEO of a company called Fair Share. We had an online community of investors with interest in the IPOs of young companies. The idea was to build an audience by giving them education about deal structures and valuation and the ability to share due diligence. Once we got the critical mass, our plan was to provide companies free access to their public off, uh, to pitch their public offerings to our members, provided they had a legal offering, they passed due diligence, they used our deal structure, the fair share model, and allowed our members to invest as little as $100. It was crowdfunding before the term was coined. And I'm, I'm curious, I mean, I, we've got a lot of interesting stuff that we're going to talk about. And I, um, I, I want to um, tell the, the listeners that we may take a slightly different format because of what Carl's experience is. But um, <clears throat> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go straight into the question, which is about my worst investment. And since no one ever goes into their investment, worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it. And in this case, I think you're going to tell us a little bit about not only what is the fair share model, but also the concepts that you've learned and the, the, the mistakes that you've seen along the way. So take it away, Carl. All right. So let me start off by just telling you what the fair share model is. It's for a venture stage company that is having an IPO, a, a raising venture capital via a public offering. In it, there are two classes of stock. Both vote, one trades, one doesn't. Investors get the tradable stock. So that's the IPO investors and the pre-IPO investors. Employees get it as well for value generated as of the IPO date. But for future performance, for most of the enterprise value is, the employees get a voting stock that doesn't trade. It converts into the tradable stock based on performance criteria they describe in their prospectus or subsequently both classes of stocks agree to. So the basic idea is instead of um, developing a valuation upfront before the investors uh, come in, the valuation unfolds based on performance. And how does that differ from, let's say, you know, a typical structure or the way things or what was going wrong, you know, in the other structures? Well, so I, I say I, this, this insight I developed um, from writing the book is that there's basically three equity structures, three capital structures for equity. 
a conventional capital structure, a modified conventional capital structure, and the fair share model. Conventional capital structure is used in most IPOs and in private offerings where uh, you don't have professional investors, friends and family type investors. The hallmark is there's a single class of stock. So an investor who owns say 10% of, of, of the company, if, uh, if, if it's um, going to be acquired, they get 10% of the proceeds. Um, Hold on, I see the noise here, Andrew. Yep, no problem. Noise is okay. It's a family podcast. Yeah, you know, uh, Suzanne, are you down in there? Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, got it. Um, a modified conventional capital structure. Well, so uh, a conventional capital structure, the hallmark is a single class of stock. So if you were to think of it in terms of literary uh, models, it's sort of like the three musketeers, all for one and uh, all for one, one for all and all for one. Mm. A modified conventional capital structure is used by professional investors, venture capital funds, private equity funds. The hallmark is a multiple class of stock. Multi-class capital structures are needed if you're going to treat shareholders differently. And what professional investors require are deal terms that give them specific rights and privileges. So uh, from a literary standpoint, it's a bit like George Orwell's Animal Farm. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. <laughs> and it's those those big investors that end up building in better terms for themselves or they do they oh so so here's an important point uh in this that i got was that investors in the venture stage they face two fundamental risks value uh failure risk and valuation risk failure risk is the risk that a company is not going to achieve the operational targets that it investors are expecting. You might think of it like, I say I'm going to jump up to here to the yep. top of my head, but I actually am somewhere between here and the floor. Mm. That's failure risk. Um, you, can, you, you can use due diligence to avoid it, but once you're in, um, you can try to use influence with management. Uh, you may rely on corporate governance. But if there's an investment in a private company, you're pretty much strapped in for the ride. If yep. you invest in a public company and, and you, you sense a, a rise in failure risk, you can always sell your shares. Yep. Valuation risk is different. It's the risk of overpaying for a position. And you can overpay for a position in a company that hits all of its marks. Mm. Now, what distinguishes, you know, you take a look at the most successful investors in the venture space and they're venture capital funds and private equity invest funds. They are better at assessing and controlling failure risk because they, they, they see more deals, they, they, there's experience and they tend to invest enough where they have more influence with, with management and, and can affect things. They're way better at controlling valuation risk. The way they do that is with deal terms. Deal terms such as uh, price ratchet, which uh, basically have the effect of saying, if, if a subsequent investor gets a better price than they did, the company owes the investor more shares for free. It could be that the subsequent investor doesn't pay enough of a premium, which triggers that. A liquidation preference is, is another one where um, it, it entitles the investor to receive their investment back or a multiple of that before any remaining proceeds are shared with other sh classes of shareholders. There's redemption rights. There's a bag of tools right. that can be used to mitigate valuation risk. And it's a great idea. 
and I allowed these investors to do very well in, in a in a in an area that has high failure risk. And I guess um, when you look at this, it's really a lopsided transaction in the sense that the the people who built the business know all about the business. But truth is, the investors know all about investing. So they yeah. come at the founders with all of these terms, all of this stuff. <clears throat> and I could imagine that many founders make mistakes in that transaction under pressure yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's go through some of the, the things that you've seen then and maybe try to identify, you know, some of the things that you would like to share about that. Well, I, I would say that oftentimes, um, on, so there's mistakes that entrepreneurs make. Mm. They don't understand the deal terms. They, they may think that, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say there's, there's an old saying in the venture business an investor will tell an entrepreneur, I'll give you your valuation if you give me my terms. Because these deal terms have the effect of, of potentially giving a, a theoric victory. You know, the, 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 the entrepreneur may think that they got that high valuation, but they don't realize that the rubber bands are there. Uh, the, the, it, it's sort of uh, like going to sleep in a room where there's a python in the corner. You know, if it's hungry, <laughs> you're not gonna be very happy. Um, but, you know, valuation is a problem for investors too. I drew the analogy in the book about the problem with setting valuations for venture stage, venture stage companies is as challenging as being put in front of a classroom of elementary school kids and being charged with the challenge of ranking them based on who's going to be a success in life or who's going to be the most happy. You can define those terms however you want. The point is you're gonna be wrong because life is like that. It takes time to, to, to play out. When a valuation has to be set at the time of the equity investment, it, it is forcing an unnatural that's a great um, way of really? describing it. No, That's a great you. way of describing it because as I'm listening to what you're saying, and let's just use that analogy and say, you know, I'm, we're going to go in and we're going to put down money on one of these kids out of 50 or 100 or whatever. No. And, and, and we're going to get a right to X percent of their income. Yeah. You know, yeah. over a long period of time. And, and, and what we have to do is we have to beat a random selection. Yeah. <laughs> and especially in, in, for new, new companies, where there's pivots that need to be made, um, changes in strategies. And, you know, we're, we're in an era, we've been in one for several decades now, where the half-life of companies is dropping dramatically. I, I think I saw something where uh, in the 1930s, the you know, looking at the companies that were on the Dow Jones in, Industrial, um, the average age was about 75 years. Mm. A couple of years ago, the average age was about 15 years. So it, it's more and more challenging for companies to have a durable value proposition because their environment changes so so rapidly, so unexpectedly. So both sides of the transaction, the entrepreneurial team and the investors are, are dealing with this great anxiety. If, it, if I need evaluation, what, what will it be? And there's all sorts of efforts to avoid it, to kick the can down the road. In early stage companies, you see uh, uh, convertible notes. You see other type of instruments uh, uh, keep agreement to uh, keep uh, safe agreements, they, they call it, SAFE and, and KISS agreements. Um, in M&A, mergers and acquisitions, you, you often find companies having to, first off, the price that they pay for a company isn't 
is, is driven by emotion or, or other issues other than valuation calculations. Mm. And for that reason, you can see companies having to write off um, goodwill, excess price paid over time. You see in, in, in uh, various types of separation agreements or mergers, the idea of a clawback, mm. you know, price is set and there's a clawback saying, all right, if it turns out that that's too much, we get to pull back some of that value. Or mm. it could be an earnout where we say, well, we'll agree to a, a price, but it may not be the right price. Maybe you can earn more if, yeah. if the performance of the, of the unit is there. So this, there's this battle between the imperative to set a price and the great uncertainty as to what it should be. So I think, you know, you've shared some great stuff. I mean, this, this analogy of the story of trying to pick the winner out of a class of kids mm -hmm. is a great way of thinking of what they're doing from an investment perspective. So maybe now we can kind of just run through some of the main things that you've learned that you can share, particularly thinking that the audience is probably, you know, probably more startup folks than it is investors. So maybe you can just go through some of the things that you've learned from your experience. Well, I, I think the biggest thing is to realize that, well, first off, valuation is a complex topic, but no one knows how to do it right. <laughs> and, and, I, and I suggest to people that I can give them two questions that if they're, they're in a gathering of people who are either raising money or have invested money, two questions that they can ask and, and, and really show their, their influence. One is, you ask, uh, when we're talking about the company, what's the valuation? And you might start to see a funny look on the person's face, mm. you know, because you know, they, they may not know what it is and they may know what it is, but not be sure how to calculate it. Or they may know how, what it was and how to calculate it, but they're not very certain that it's, mm. you know, it's a good number. And the second question you could ask is, why does that make sense? Yep. Mm. So having some comment, you know, the, the, the tools that one learns in courses like the ones that you have, um, I think are fundamental in terms of working through the riggings. Um, and it is complex, but it could step back and, 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 and basically recognize that uh, if, if you don't want to get into that full depth, there's a lesson here and that nobody, nobody knows how to do this particularly well. And if you think about capital markets, um, I, I think that they're not necessarily rigged. I don't think people have uh, uh, that much influence. Um, but they're tilted against the interest of average investors. <laughs> they're not and rigged, but they're tilted. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, 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 and it's possible, I believe, to have innovation that benefits average investors, that benefits uh, entrepreneurs in, in sectors that have trouble attracting venture capital or who want an alternative way to approach it. Mm. And can you give your formula for valuation? You had talked to me about simplifying earlier before we started the podcast. And maybe you throw in your formula for happiness just for you know, oh, yeah. a little bonus. Yeah. Well, so, so we were talking about you know, devices that I was using in the book to make complex topics accessible. And, and so I, I use uh, the idea of concept equations and I lead off with an example of a concept equation for happiness. Happiness equals what's happening minus expectations. So you can improve happiness by improving what's happening or lowering your expectations. With respect hmm. to, to uh, valuation, I, I had written an article recently where I, I identified the drivers of valuation. I said valuation equals analytics 
plus emotion, plus deal terms. Analytics um, has is it discounted cash flow, for example, and 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 it, it intellectually it's a great idea, hmm. very appealing. The problem is that the the raw material it calls upon, which is projections of cash flows, are notoriously difficult yep. to make in a reliable way. Um, and you know, so so that's sort of a a, a fundamental uh, a, a approach. If you're looking at comparable companies, you know, it's the same issue there too. No, nobody really knows what they're particularly worth. Uh, emotion, emotion is um, plays a very key role in invest investment decisions. Whether what a, an entrepreneur is going to sell shares for or what the investor is willing to pay. Um, I, I, there's an anecdote I have in a book about a guy who's a venture capitalist who became one after uh, having several successes as an entrepreneur. And he says he, he called some friends and he said, uh, what's the secret regarding valuation? And he was told, there is no secret. We fall in love with we fall in love with uh, a, a company's a market, its team, and its technology. We think other people will too. But deal terms play a very critical role, and that's sort of the safety net mm. for all that enthusiasm. If things go wrong, it it allows the investor to recover. So. That's some of the basic insights. It's, it's, yep. it's a complex topic, but it's not. It, it, it's only because it's unfamiliar. Yep. When you, it's, it's sort of like talking about biology. You mm. know, that's complex. Uh, uh, yeah. Geology, it, just about anything. The interesting thing for the for the startup company is that they don't really need to deal with it until they have to, and maybe it's the same with biology. You know, you don't have to worry about. Um, how do you heal a, a hurt knee until you have it? And then all of a sudden you have Very to think, okay, yeah. ten, tendons, ligaments, muscles, you know, all that. Um, yeah. I would, go ahead. Well, it, it, there are things about um, deal terms. The importance of deal terms for entrepreneurs just to understand, I, I think is, is, is key. And then getting the idea. Let me tell. Can, I, I'd like to tell you two big things that I think will come out of the Fisher model. Yep. Let me give you an example. Let's say I have a company that I've raised two million dollars for um, in private money, and now I want to raise twenty million dollars in an additional round. I can go private or public. If I'm going private, that's a venture round because twenty million is a lot of money. If I go the private route, I'm going to wind up with a modified conventional capital structure. I'll have deal terms that should things not necessarily work the way I'm hoping, the $2 million investors and the employees, including the founders get squeezed. If I go public, I have two choices. I can do the conventional capital structure or the fair share model. Let's assume for a moment that comparable companies are worth $100 million. You would expect, I would file, if I use a conventional capital structure, that I would file for my IPO with a pre money valuation of $100 million. Mm. I would raise my $20 million in the IPO. Immediately after the IPO closes, I would have a post money valuation of $120 million, right? 100 plus the 20. Um, and then in the secondary market, it would float depending on what's going on. If I were to use the fair share model, I would file my uh, $20 million IPO with a pre money valuation of something like 10 million, not 100 million. The reason I would do that is. One of my deal uh, performance measures is the rise in the market cap of the company. If I'm 
if that's a performance measure, I want it as low to, as possible to begin with. Mm -hmm. 10 million gives a little kick for my $2 million investors. Um, I would raise the 20 million. My post money valuation would be 30 million, the 10 plus the 20. My bet would be that secondary market investors would be recognizing my company as an undervalued asset and bid the price up. As that happens, the employee stock, the voting stock that doesn't trade, converts into the tradable stock. That's diluting the position of the investors, but they don't care mm. because the value of their position is going up. Right. So that's one profound thing. It, it, normally investors are going to be attracted to a company based on the market, the technology, and the team. Now there's a fourth factor. It's a deal. Mm, okay. But the bigger deal, I think, is when it comes to this alignment of investors and employees. So let's assume for a moment that I've raised my 20 million and I want to hire you, Andrew. Somehow I, I, I'm able to do that. Yep. And, and you have an offer from Apple. And I say, Andrew, I can pay you a salary it won't be as much as Apple. I can offer you benefits. It won't be as nice as Apple's. I can offer you stock options on my tradable stock. And they have more upside than Apple's. Mm. But I can offer you something that Apple cannot. And that's an interest in my performance stock pool. That's a non-tradable voting stock. And it only has value if we as a team are delivering these results. There's an esprit de corps that comes from that. Um, it, there's this a more intimate relationship between work and reward than stock options can, can provide. That's not influenced so much on when, when you join the company. There's ideas that an entrepreneur, if I wanted to raise that $20 million, um, I might say, Hey, you know, I, I could raise all of that from some private equity funds or some large investors. But let's say I have a consumer product and I want to expand uh, marketing uh, efforts. I could say, I want my big investors to commit to 15 million, be on standby for 5 million. Mm. And for a month, I want to allow investors to invest as much as $100. The idea of, so, so assuming I sell 5 million of it goes to in, in $100 allotment, I've got 50,000 new investors who, who have gotten the deal price on the IPO. They're going to make money more assuredly than if I use the conventional capital structure. But I'm achieving a marketing objective without spending any marketing dollars. It's just simply of how I'm allocating my, my, my capital. The more investors I have, the more transactions are likely to occur in the secondary market. I'm, I'm, it's, it's something that's helpful for me to um, qualify for a better exchange. Um, so capital formation, valuation, deal structure, it's sort of like the, the, the real system, the real complexity isn't so much how you calculate these things, but how they all sort of fit into an economy. How do you, how do you uh, in, in, a, in a world that's full of volatility, where the, the advantage of low cost uh, is, is, is not necessarily long, long lasting and you wanna have alliances, um, it, it just opens up a palette of, of, of ideas. You could take that performance stock, you could use it as a sweetener for your pre-IPO investors. You might uh, use it to enhance your supply chain, mm -hmm. you know, yep. where, where key suppliers, you know, normally you would have a negotiation on price and terms and quality, but you could say, hey, if, if you're well-performing, we'll a lot some performance stock for you and and if we do well you you will do well so and 
what's yeah. interesting you you mentioned about ICOs and stuff like that and one of the things about that type of I mean in 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 my coffee business I've been looking at the idea of could we do some sort of ICO that is related really ultimately let's just say a utility coin that is mm -hmm. a um, a loyalty type of coin that encourages mm -hmm. our farmers and growers to always sell to us rather than to a competitor and to encourage our customers at the other end to always sell buy from us rather than from a competitor and then if they earn coins from that then that would be something that you know would give them a loyalty program that would give them a lower price or a better deal or whatever but then if those coins uh, were tradable then if the farmer said oh, i've got to put my my child through um, high school and therefore i need to get some cash they could sell that coin but also if we tied that coin into a performance of the company where we said 10 percent of the profits of the company would be allocated to that coin then all of a sudden we've got a performance aspect that we start to bring into it that says anybody who participates in this coin is also really incentivized to make sure that this company as a whole this whole ecosystem of a business is you know making more so that that's just something that made me think about yeah, it, 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 it's a great point. Um, the thing I would add to it is you said profit sharing. Um, with performance stock, the, the wealth isn't tied to profitability. It's tied to the performance goals, mm. which could include profitability. It could include a rise in the market value, but it could include... Um, the the ultimate acquisition price of a company um if there is one or intriguingly even measures of the social good so in the example that you you provide if 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 uh, the methodology of, of farming and cultivation is 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 an important part of your brand um and and you've got some suppliers who are adhering to that more than the others it, it, you know, that that could become an element mm. with this, this great al alignment so performance um, so in other words you set certain performance targets and you know let's just say that we want to want more farmers to be organic or to use a processing method that uses less water as we continue to convert them to that we're yeah, yeah. performance you, you, targets think 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 of um you know i, I say in, in the book that the the fair share model will be uh, to capital markets what Linux is to computer operating systems. Linux is that kernel, that open source kernel that um, uh, basically displaced a lot of proprietary operating systems. Mm -hmm. So the feature is that there's a lot of variation in how it's implemented. It'll be different in the food business versus the software business versus manufacturing versus the uh, uh, service business. The stage of development will affect it. The personalities of the people involved will affect it. You mentioned blockchain or ICOs. The last chapter in the book deals with blockchain and ICOs. And basically I say, it doesn't matter if you're denominating ownership in stock or tokens, you still have a valuation issue. But I, I close with an example of how a company might be able to use an IPO with the stock using the fair share model mm. and ICOs, it's not mutually exclusive. So, so think of this example, uh, say it's a movie studio or a studio of some type that has multiple products. It could use a fair share model IPO to raise its parent level capital and then use ICO security tokens to fund specific projects and ICOs of a functional current uh, token to achieve a marketing goal uh, or royalty program along the lines that you described. So, so there's a rich palette here to, to play around with. So for the listeners out there who are interested in it, let's, I'm going to put the links to the, in the show notes to the book. I think I want to now start to wrap up and I want, I would love for you to give one piece of advice for a company that is getting ready to raise capital. They don't know much about it. They're talking to some VCs, they're talking to family offices, they're talking to different people. 
what one piece of advice would you give them? Hmm. Well, recognize that, that the dimensions to, to this. Um, and and uh, I, I think my book can help open awareness to that, but recognize the importance of deal terms. <laughs> Under, pro, do, do, do some ther serious thinking um, and discussions with people who, uh, other people who have raised money uh, as entrepreneurs or if you're in investors and understand what each of these terms has the potential to do um, to your other shareholders. Great, great point. And, uh, you know, I think for the listeners out there, look at these deal terms uh, and also think about what could happen if what would happen in relation to this deal term if things went really well or went really poorly. I think if, that's if they go well, if, if they go well uh, with a conventional type of deal, it's it, everybody's sort of happy. Yep. The, 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 the one thing that I, I, I suggest in the fair share model is to make it attractive is if it's going to be successful, well performing teams have to have the ability to wind up with more of the tradable wealth that they create with their labor than they could with a VC. Got it. And, uh, that's a great summary of what, what you're getting at with the fair share model. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, at, at just one last thing for me. I, whenever I go in and teach valuation, the first thing I do is I go up to the board and I write down Y-A-A-W. And I ask the students to try to figure out Y-A-A-W. And the answer is, you are always wrong. In value. <laughs> and it, it, so I call it y'all. But I say uh, <laughs> it, it aligns exactly with what you said, which is there is no right answer. And that's that the framework that we talk about in valuation is just that it is a framework. But it is not, there is no right answer. There is a range, as you said, which was another thing that I liked. Um, so and what it means, sometimes when people hear that there's no right answer, they think, well, what's the point of all this? Well, there's a lot of benefit of learning how that structure works and understanding what are the drivers. And you talked about the drivers of valuation um, being the analytics, the emotion, and the deal terms. When it comes to the analytics, I always tell my clients in particular that there's four drivers of value of a company when we look at it from the analytics side. And I usually stand up in front of them and turn around and show them the back of my body. And um, <clears throat> I keep my clothes on, of course, but I ask and I point at my butt and I ask them, what is this? And they, they shout out things like ass. But in fact, what I teach them is it's my rear. And then I teach them that there's four drivers in the traditional model of DCF. It's revenue, which is the R in rear. Keep it up, get the revenue up. Expenses, which is the E in rear, bring them down or bring them down relative to revenue. And then the A in rear is the amount of assets that you deploy in the company. You want to either reduce the assets or get more from the existing assets. And then R is the risk. And that is a bigger one where we try to, we try to capture risk in the model through the discount rate and all that. But there's many, many different types of risks, not just, you know, um, the risk that we're used to in looking at a model, there's risk of geographic, you know, uh, dispersion of your revenue and all that. So there's a lot of different things that I, uh, I appreciate the discussion about. Um, is there anything you would add to those things I just said? You know, there's a lot of similarities to what we're talking about, to philosophy, even religion, you know. Uh, uh, social, show, social discussions, uh, uh, they're important for the well-functioning of a system. Um, but it's difficult to take out in a, a concept like justice, for example, mm -hmm. and say, yeah, exactly, exactly what does that, how does it look like? But, but, but everybody in a system has to feel that there's enough of it to make it work. Valuation's a little bit like that. 
it's, it's a social science in a sense. And, and so I think your students could say, hey, you, you would be advised to understand there are techniques that's like chemistry or something. There, there's, there's technical rules or techniques that you use to figure out something, but you want to step back. I, I, I say in the book, think evaluation as art. And I describe how I experience art in a museum. You know, I'll stand back, I'll get close, look at the mm -hmm. side, look at the placard. They're all expression, human expressions of an emotion or an image or something. And the more I see, the more I recognize in, 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 in new pieces of work. Yeah. Valuations like that, because it's an expression of human hopes and fears and ambitions and, and all sorts of things. And the more you pay attention to it, you get clued into, if nothing else, what, what the other per party across this, uh, the table view is of humans, human mm. society. Yep. So for those listeners out there that want to dig deeper into it, just go and get the fair share model, a performance-based capital structure for venture stage initial public offerings. Also, um, my, my book about nine valuation mistakes and how to avoid them is a good one because I try to highlight the mistakes that I see people making in real life. And I talk a lot about what Carl has said, which is that um, finance is both art and science. Science is the structure, but now, now what Carl teaches us is that art, the art aspect is the emotion. And I guess the other art part is the art of the deal, the deal yeah. term. <laughs> so now <laughs> let me uh, let me ask you the last question, which is what's your number one goal for yourself or your business in the next 12 months? Uh, to launch a, a social movement to reimagine capitalism, to see enough investor interest in the Fisher model that companies consider adopting it to raise venture capital via an IPO. Exciting. And for those listeners that are interested in learning more, I'll also have all the contact details for Carl on the uh, on the show notes. So feel free to reach out there. All right, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember to go to myworstinvestmentever.com slash deals to claim your discount on how my course, how to start building your wealth, investing in the stock market. As we conclude, Carl, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf okay. yes, of A Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? It's possible to innovate in this space in a way that benefits investors, companies, and economies. Beautiful. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.